we're going to go ahead and get going. Welcome to everybody. I'm Nicholas Hodgman, uh, Dr. Hodgman, uh, interventional cardiologist. Today we're going to uh, go through some exciting things and learn a little bit about what happens during a heart attack. Um, we hope, as we discuss this, really the goal is to have <clears throat> some background of knowledge to help each other, help people around you, and help yourself if you were to have symptoms. And a really a strong believer that knowledge is power, power to help each other. So. Hang on one second. More technical difficulties. Okay, so uh, in this session, we're going to cover uh, some anatomy of the heart so we know what a heart attack is. We'll have to look at the structure of the heart and the vessels that feed it. Next, we'll talk uh, what exactly is going on with the heart attack, and then we can look forward to uh, future webinars where we talk about screening, how to treat heart attacks, and how to prevent heart attacks. So what is a heart attack? <clears throat> a heart attack really only occurs if there's heart muscle damage. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see that there's heart muscle and then the blood vessels on the outside that feed the heart heart muscle and what we're concerned about is saving heart muscle once heart muscle has been damaged you can never get that back uh, and that is the that's the primary concern for heart cardiologists and heart doctors and for patients is saving heart muscle and we'll talk a little bit more about that heart muscle gets damaged uh, when an artery which is a blood vessel that feeds blood oxygenated blood to the heart gets blocked we call those arteries or blood vessels that feed the heart coronary arteries. There's really two things that can block off uh, a blood vessel to the heart and cause heart muscle damage, causing a heart attack. That's either a blood clot or plaque, and usually, almost all the time, it's both. A plaque uh, with a blood clot on top of it. If any of you have logged into the chat session, you can also ask questions at any time, and um, we'll answer those along the way or towards the end. We're going to advance your slides here in just a second. So here's kind of our first quiz for those that have joined, uh, just for fun. If you look on the right side of the slide, there's two EKGs that a patient might might come in with. Uh, one of those EKGs uh, is showing a really bad heart attack. The other one is normal. So if you're logged in and you want to chat, you can try and pick. You can say, I think it's the top EKG that there's a heart attack, or I think it's the bottom EKG, and we'll see, uh, see if you guys can be uh, future emergency room physicians. So we'll give you a second just to log in and think about that. When someone with a heart attack, someone with a heart attack uh, presents to the emergency room, uh, that's the first thing they'll get. Within five minutes, they should get an EKG. That's the electrical tracing of the heart. It kind of tells us how the heart muscle is doing electrically. The next thing they'll get is a lab test called a troponin. So let's see if we have any answers. Well, we've got some smart people joining in. So first, uh, Phil and Susan are both correct. It's the top EKG that shows a large heart attack. And uh, I don't have a pointer here, but you can see, uh, if you can see in the top one, uh, up in the top right corner of the EKG, it looks like what we call um, a little tombstone. No. <laughs> yeah, so we won't share that with too many patients, but you can see, I guess you can see my pointer now here. Those are all abnormal. On the bottom there is, uh, you can see a normal EKG. This patient here is doing fine. So this lab test called the troponin, 
is uh, is, is kind of the last 20 years has really changed cardiology. It is a specific protein that uh, heart muscle has, and it's very sensitive. If we draw draw a patient's blood and we see any troponin, meaning it's leaked out of the heart muscle, we know that some heart muscle has been damaged. So it's a very specific test that we can do and can tell immediately in the ER. Test takes about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes to run. We can tell immediately in the ER if some heart damage has been done. I would ask that uh, if you are using the phone to listen in that you mute your phone so we don't get background noise from your phone. So if, you're, if you've called in and you're listening, we just ask that you mute your phone. Okay, here here's our test number two. Now this is an ultrasound, ultrasound of the heart, what we call echocardiogram. So if you uh, look here, I have two separate patients. And um, we're going to have a test here, and uh, I'm not going to tell you much about these right now. I just want you to guess. Do you think it's the top left ultrasound of the heart that the patient's had a heart attack or the bottom right? Bottom right. The bottom right? Give it as a test. I think it's the upper left. <laughs> this one looks crazy. We have uh, we have some amps, answers there, and we've got some bright people there. Again, we ask that you mute your phone because we can hear all the background noise. So if your if your phone is not currently muted, okay. Uh, so let's just explain up in the upper left. This is, all, this is the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart. And the bottom, and you can see that the heart muscle is nice and thick, and all of it's squeezing in normally. And down here at the bottom, this unfortunate patient has had a large heart attack in the bottom portion of the heart. If you look here, the thin, and there's nothing moving in. Hang on one second. We're going to move on here. So, excellent job for those that guess guess this. Hello. We'll move to the next uh, slide here. This is uh, this is why it's so important that there be no heart muscle damage, and why we want to prevent heart attacks. And I'll explain this slide to you. If you look here uh, on the bottom, this is the. Uh, the ability of the heart to pump blood, and we measure that in this field. Uh, it's called an ejection fraction. It's how much blood actually the heart pumps out. And uh, the way this happens is a normal range for a heart is to be pumping 55% of the blood out of the heart. That's normal. So at baseline, a normal heart does not pump 100% of the blood out. can see on this graph here, if your pumping function decreases because you've had a heart attack, here's normal here, this is the normal range. If you have a heart attack and your pumping function just decreased a little bit, over four years you're you're gonna live uh you know your your chances of living over four years is you know near normal. Again, we ask you, you you mute your phone if you uh, have the opportunity because we're getting a lot of background noise.
Okay, continuing on, um, if you have a heart attack, say, and you lose uh, half the function of your heart, so that would be about 30%. Uh, or less, then your your chances of dying in a, in four years go up to about 13%. If you have a large heart attack, you can see that your chances of dying over four years are uh, significant. So half the people who lose, you know, more than half of their hearts will not survive four years. So with a heart heart attack, it's all about it's all about how much heart muscle has been damaged. Um, so we, uh, so this is the reason why we are so uh, concerned and worried about heart muscle damage, because you, the patient's life will actually be shorter the more heart muscle damage is done. That is what this slide is showing. If you have any questions about that slide, just go ahead and chat in and uh, send us the text. We're going to move on. So one of the major concerns about heart, heart muscle damage uh, or a heart attack is uh, what happens outside of the hospital before people come to the ER at all. And one of the major concerns we have uh, is what's called electrical instability. So there are many, uh, about 50% of heart attacks we see, uh, the patients never make it to the hospital because of electrical instability. And that just means if you look up above this heart rhythm, which is called ventricular fibrillation, this is not good. So what happens is the part of the heart that's not getting enough blood becomes electrically unstable. And you have a rhythm here where the whole bottom part of the heart is just shaking, which fibrillation is another word for shaking. And you cannot survive this. You're, this is this is in less than a second of this electrical rhythm, and you people pass out, and uh, they do not survive this, and that is why there's been a big push across the nation over the past five to ten years to place AEDs. This is an automated external defibrillator, and uh, if you can put this on a patient who um, has collapsed. And it will analyze this rhythm, and it will try and pick up this rhythm, which it does significantly well on it, all on its own. And you can deliver a shock and shock someone out of this dangerous heart rhythm and save their life. I just repeat again, when heart muscle gets damaged by a heart attack, 50% of the time you'll have a rhythm like this. And 50% of all heart attacks never make it to the hospital because of this rhythm. So that's a that's a, a major issue for us as cardiologists is trying to help these people outside of the hospital. Well, what's really going on in the blood vessel itself that's causing a heart attack? Now we talked about really what happens when an artery, a blood vessel to the heart gets all the way plugged, and we're going to start right with this one right here. You can see here that this blood vessel is completely plugged in this picture of a blood vessel. The yellow is plaque buildup. That's cholesterol plaque buildup, which we'll talk about more in a minute. The pink is all normal here. That's heart, that's um, muscle inside of the blood vessel itself. And then that bright, the bright red in the middle is a blood clot. And that was what makes, that's what makes a heart attack is when you have a blood clot that plugs off, finally plugs off plaque that's been building up over time. Now, why does a blood clot all of a sudden show up there? Because most people uh, have a little bit of plaque in their, in their vessels. Some people have more, and they do just fine. They wouldn't. This patient wouldn't do too fine. It's too narrow to do fine. But you can see up here, we think some of these plaques start in in the teeth. We know some of these plaques start when when uh, patients are teenagers. So these plaques build up over a lifetime. And blood can get through here smoothly, and most people can even tolerate this to some degree, a blockage like this. But why does a blood clot appear? Well, that's why I have this picture of a real blood vessel to the right. This is taken from a patient who <clears throat> obviously didn't make it. Sorry to be so blunt. And one of the reasons they didn't make it is because you can see here this blood vessel on the inside has torn. This is what we call a rupture of a plaque. 
if you can imagine this part in here is black, that's the same as the yellow over here. Cholesterol, many little other little things we're going to talk about that hide in here. And what happens is uh, for a random reason or sometimes during exertion, this uh, plaque is unstable and it ruptures open. And once you see an opening here, if you look at where my arrow is, this is where blood would flow normally. Blood should not flow back in here, just only out here. And so as the blood is flowing, when this ruptures open, our blood is, uh, is built uh, to fix things. And when it sees that this is open, it tries to seal this off with a blood clot. And it overreacts and seals off the whole vessel. And a blood clot would fill this whole portion and stop all blood flow to the heart. And that's why people present with heart attacks. Any questions about that? If there is, just go ahead and chat in. Again, this is what we call a ruptured plaque. It's just a broken open uh, plaque on the inside, and uh, and then a blood clot uh, appears. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit. Talk a little bit why it's so important to take aspirin. Now we're not going to have We're going to have too much uh, detail about this uh, slide here, but I do want to let you know that. Many patients I talk to want to blame uh, want to blame their heart disease or blame plaque in their vessels on one particular thing, and this slide would uh, would would be opposite from that theory. <laughs> Plaques in the blood vessels are caused by multiple things, and the overarching my arrow oh there it is the overarching uh, reason for plaque buildup which you may not have known is inflammation that's the same kind of inflammation like as if you got a hangnail and it gets red and warm and and uh and looks a little infected it's almost the same thing in the blood vessel inflammation is basically your own white blood cells your own immune system uh, attacking the wall of your blood vessels and why does it do that well you can look here if you look on this slide here, this little thing called a monocyte is a white blood cell that normally fights infection, like the flu or what other viruses you might have. You can see here the way it enters into a vessel wall is by these little connectors. So the, the vessel wall itself signals for help. And why would the vessel wall signal for help, for help from your own white blood cells? Well, that's because there's too much cholesterol in the vessel wall and it gets triggered. And you can see over here, if, if you were noticing, this little this little word called LDL. Now I'll just ask a quick another quick test question since this is a cardiology 101. Is LDL good cholesterol or bad cholesterol? Feel free to chat that in if you have an answer. When you get your uh, no, there we go. We got a couple of good answers there. We've got two star students up front here. I can see that. That's good. And LDL is the bad bad cholesterol, and you can see what it's doing here. It comes in, and it causes injury to the vessel wall, and then the vessel wall says, help me, and these white blood cells come in, and then, then a whole slew of what we call inflammation, the white blood cells attacking the vessel wall, thinking that it's an enemy, causes uh, this whole yellow plaque. And things start getting dangerous when that plaque uh, is so much attacking from the own immune cells going that, that cells are, are dying in the middle. And you can see this black portion is actually a bunch of dead white blood cells and dead vessel wall tissue. And, and that's when this plaque becomes unstable. And that's when it can rip open. You can see here uh, on the corner here, it's torn open. And then you can see that there's a special blood cell called a platelet which is the, that is the initiator of all blood clots. So you can imagine if one platelet or two platelets stick here, this in less than a second or less than a couple seconds, this whole vessel will fill up with blood clot based upon that little rupture there. Now, you can see here cholesterol on the list to the right is only one of the things that causes damage to the vessel wall, which triggers your own body to attack your vessel wall and cause inflammation. So number one on the list, of course, is cigarettes. So cigarettes 
by itself causes cigarettes by itself causes uh, um, damage to the vessel wall, uh, which can trigger this whole process. It also cigarettes also uh, trigger blood clots. So people who smoke their platelets, which go around causing blood clots, are revved up and ready to go way more, uh, you know, twice or more is likely to cause blood clots than someone who's not smoking. High blood pressure, which puts pressure on the vessel wall, causes damage, does the same thing as cholesterol. Damage to the poor vessel wall, which then signals for help and calls these blood cells in that cause the plaque. And then, of course, diabetes is a major risk factor. And diabetes, you know, deposits sugars and damages the wall uh, all along uh, by depositing sugar along the wall or a, a, a technically a, a chemical breakdown of sugar, but then the same process happens. It triggers the, your own immune system to cause inflammation in the wall. Any uh, <clears throat> questions about that so far? Now, of course, we all know patients, at least I, may, I know patients, that don't smoke, blood pressure's in good control, no diabetes, very good cholesterol, and they still have really bad heart disease. And so this is also a genetic disease, which is why your doctors are always concerned about your parents and your siblings and whether they have heart disease, because genetically people can trigger their own plaques and signal their own uh, white blood cells to cause inflammation and build this plaque without any of these risk factors. And we've seen that plenty, unfortunately. In, in my practice, you see it plenty. <clears throat> Any questions about that? If there are, go ahead and text them. Uh, I mean, chat them in, and then uh, we can continue here. So <clears throat> the last thing we should talk about is uh, why people present to the emergency room or to their doctors with different symptoms. And there certainly are a wide variety of symptoms. Now, initially, we had thought over the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, that women tend to present uh, in a different pattern than men. They might have different symptoms. And recently, in the last five years, we found out, no, they present the same way. They just don't complain as much as men. Certainly true in my house. So it's nothing, you know, a woman will present with the same symptoms as a man. She just won't uh, tell you all about them. And so that is why many many studies have shown that women are not being treated as well as men with heart attacks. And that's one of the reasons we think why. But it's definitely been proven now that women present with the same symptoms. There's nothing, uh, you know, exceptionally different about it. Both people, both men and women, present typically with the same symptoms. And what are those symptoms that we're concerned about? Well, you know, obviously any chest pain, pressure, or tightness. And really, and in my practice and in my experience, it's anything between the waist and the chin could uh, potentially be uh, a threatening heart attack. And obviously both arms have been in, uh, included, pain in the arms, uh, typically not numbness in the arms, but pain in the arms, in the jaw, in the teeth, uh, around up the neck, uh, many different ways. And one of those reasons that people present is because in the process of having heart attacks, people are in different stages. So if you look at this slide, some patients will come to the clinic complaining and say, well, I get chest tightness or I'm getting out of breath every time I walk. And that's typically the patient at number four or number six. And those are patients where there's no blood clot there, but there's a significant blockage. And so their heart just is not getting enough blood when they exert themselves. When they are going upstairs or when they want to walk their dog, that's typically what they'll say. And those patients, you know, they don't need to be hospitalized, but we obviously need to do a stress test or take a look. And in our next webinar, we'll talk about what stress tests we have and ways we treat people to on this. Keep in mind, if we can pick up and find this this level of plaque in a patient, we might be able to avoid uh, heart attacks, which is when the blood clots, that's the dark purple or black you see, gets involved. That's really what we want to avoid. It's nice to avoid the plaque altogether, and I think 
As a nation, we have seen much improvement over the last 15 years with plaque altogether. And if you could guess why you think the primary reason we are seeing less heart disease, let's see what you guys guess. Why are, what are primary care docs doing good that we see less heart disease? If you want to chat in a reason, um, I'd be interested to see what you're thinking. I can give you some choices. Do you think it's A, because they're good at talking patients into exercising? Do you think it's B, because of controlling blood pressure? Do you think it's C, they're doing a better job with cholesterol management? Or do you think it's E, uh, they're good at helping people stop smoking? Right, so some good answers there. I would I would agree. I think uh, we typically, as a group of physicians, feel like because statins are being used more, statins are cholesterol medications, we know that that's one of the only drugs, it is the only drug we've ever no seen able to reduce or keep a plaque stable so it doesn't get worse. No other medication really has ever shown that. Now, that's not to say exercise has been shown to do the same thing, but not to the same extent. That and really is uh, really is a way to go. tolerate it. The other issue I would think is uh, aspirin, getting patients on aspirin, which I still think we need to work on a lot. Aspirin stops blood clots, which is kind of the end result when you have a blood clot. Uh, we've said this a bunch of times now. The blood clot on top of the plaque is what really causes people to come in the hospital and which damages the heart and hurts people over a long run. Now, so we categorize patients when they come in. This patient here who just has chest pain while walking, that's someone that needs their blood vessels looked at. We'll talk about that in another webinar, but that's someone we would call stable. They have what's called stable chest pain or stable angina. Now, this patient here, this patient in number five, would complain of chest pain at rest and while they're exerting themselves. So here you can see the plaque is partially ruptured open. They've got a little blood clot in there, but not a lot. And it kind of closes off and opens and up, opens up all by itself. And that's what we call an unstable situation. And that patient would come into the hospital and have their blood thinned out so that they don't completely block off the blood vessel with a blood clot. And then of course you have people at the end here it doesn't quite show it, but like the EKG we saw in the beginning where a blood clot would fill this whole area, and those are the people that are having a heart attack, and that's an emergency, and we're going to talk about how we treat those as well. So if we come take a step back in time here, and we think about where we might be as far, at least I hope, I hope I'm out actually here on one. Somehow I doubt it, but if we look go back here, we want to remain here in the first three, and uh, the way to do that is to is to make sure that we avoid let's see we avoid these uh, risk factors here so cigarettes controlling our high blood pressure uh, diabetes and cholesterol we're almost done here one uh, other test question for you what do you think uh, what do you think the top number of your blood pressure should be so that you can protect your heart. Top, top number of the blood pressure. Lower than what? I can do, uh, do you think A, 150, B, 130, C, 120. Yep, you guys are all about right. Most of us say, boy, you guys would be tough doctors. 120, huh? That is, you know, that is ideal, especially patients who have had heart disease. We shoot for less than 120. Primary care doctors typically will work for less than 135, less than 135 of the top number, and the bottom number usually less than 85. But my patients that I see that I know have heart disease, I'm always shooting for a target of less than 120 over 80. Good. Now, just briefly before we finish up, what about uh, cholesterol level? What do you think a healthy, normal cholesterol, total cholesterol level would be? 
Good. Uh, there's someone that went easy on themselves, but we would say 150. And, uh, you know, when, when you talk to a primary care doctor, they think about cholesterol different than a cardiologist does. A cardiologist thinks specifically about the LDL because it's been so well documented, the bad cholesterol being high, uh, people do not do well in our field. So total cholesterol less than 150, uh, less than 100 is ideal in patients who have heart disease. And an LDL, a, a bad cholesterol, uh, you definitely would want less than 100. Um, and shooting for uh, 70 in your LDL if you have a known heart disease. All right, any questions there? Good. So uh, uh, it's been a pleasure doing this webinar. I'm excited to do the next one. We get to see some cast films, how we fix heart attacks. We get to talk about what you can do to screen uh, as far as treadmill stress tests and pictures. That will be on January 25th, and uh, we'll go through some screening measures. There's some new things coming uh, coming down the road. Hang on, we have a question here. Right, so we have a participant uh, asking about heart pain uh, associated with menopause. Now, um, <clears throat> this brings up some good points. Uh, typically, no matter what kind of chest pain you have, the most worrisome type of chest pain is always when you're exerting yourself. So if you were ever to have chest pain while going upstairs or any type of walking, that always needs to be seen by a doctor. So that's the most important point. We'll talk about chest pain. We'll talk a little bit more about that in some of the other upcoming webinars. Um, <clears throat> the other issue would be, uh, you know, what we are concerned about around menopause is hormone replacement therapy, which does put you at risk for heart attacks. Uh, if you have uh, chest pain at rest, it's a little more complicated to figure out what it is. We talked about in our slide, let me just go back to the slide here. People who are having chest pain at rest, typically it, uh, if it's associated with other symptoms like lightheadedness or shortness of breath or feeling sweaty or nauseated, that's something that needs to be seen by a physician. Uh, if it's chest pain uh, by itself and it's brief, sec lasting seconds, and it's a sharp burning pain, we tend to think a little bit more about uh, esophageal, you know, a reflux, um, and so that's uh, one thing that you would need to do. I think any time you have chest pain, of course, it's smart to check in with your primary care doctor and we can get a stress test and we'll be talking about stress tests in test our next webinar. We can also talk a little bit about hormone replacement therapy in, in another webinar. Essentially, the practice now across the nation is if you have to have it, because your life is miserable without it, you take it. If you don't need it, then your risk for heart disease does go up while taking it. We have a couple other questions here. Uh, typically, uh, the recommendation, national recommendations for aspirin would be anybody who is over 50 that can tolerate a baby aspirin. So 81 milligrams has been shown to be just as good as the larger dose 325 in preventing heart attacks and strokes and everyone over 50 should be on a baby aspirin if they can tolerate it. So those that would not want to take uh, baby aspirin daily are those that have ever had any troubles with ulcers in their stomach or bleeding in their stomachs. We've got another question here. So we've got a good question here uh, from someone uh, who wants to know a little bit more about troponin. Troponins can stay in your, once you have, if you come to the ER and you have a troponin drawn, um, if you've had heart damage of any type in the past 12 to 14 days, that troponin may remain positive. So uh, uh, say sometimes I'll have a patient that presents to the ER that has no chest pain um, that's in the ER for some other reason, and their troponin will turn out positive. And if you ask the patient, they'll say, oh, yeah, well, I had uh, chest pain, uh, you know, a week ago. And that troponin is sensitive enough to pick up heart damage, even the minutest of heart damage, within 10 to 12 days. We have another question. 
Um, we have a question about whether taking daily aspirin, one to two ba baby aspirin a day. Um, there's been, all the studies have shown uh, that there's no benefit to taking more than one baby aspirin a day. That's for the general patient population. That's just for if you are, you know, you don't, you don't have any other sort of health trouble or health problems. That may not be true if you're someone who's been stented or, you know, has a, a blood clotting disorder. But for most patients, one baby aspirin is completely appropriate. Um, second question. Now, some uh, patients that who have had. Uh, who have coronary artery disease, who have plaque in their blood vessels, have been worked on. Uh, now, those patients need a full-dose aspirin. Uh, they, those patients need a full-dose aspirin, and um, that depends on uh, the timing of when you've had your heart worked on. So, for example, any of my patients who have had a stent, which we'll be talking about in another webinar, or bypass surgery, we'll keep them on a full-dose aspirin three months to up to a year after the procedure. That's because they're a little more prone to having blood clots than uh, the typical person walking around. There are some patients I have that might have uh, a blood clotting disorder or something like that, and they need appropriate uh, aspirin therapy that's much higher than the typical patient. Um, <clears throat> One thing that we did want to mention uh, for those that have had uh, chest pain or in particular uh, as we go into our next webinar talking about screening, one of the benefits and advantages of presenting to the ER is you can get the stress, a stress test the same day and uh, that's good for, uh, good for us as cardiologists so we can tell what the pain is from and that has um, been beautifully set up here in our Mercy ER where you can come in with chest pain and get it uh, and get your uh, stress test the same day and uh, meet the cardiologist on a treadmill. Um, we're going to talk in the future uh, about how we can actually treat the plaque in our own heart blood vessels. We're going to talk in another webinar about doing that. I'll just mention right now, like we talked about earlier, that statin therapy is the only medication, really the only intervention that a doctor could do that would help regress plaque in your blood vessels. Now, there's plenty of things the patient can do, especially considering smoking, controlling diabetes, keeping the blood pressure down, and exercising. But we're going to talk much more about that in a future webinar. I do want to remind anybody participating today, if there's ever a question and you're at home and you have chest pain, um, I've seen so many unfortunate cases where people stay at home with chest pain uh, for 12, 12 to 16 to 24 hours thinking that they're having reflux or something else going on. And unfortunately, they've been losing heart muscle that whole time, which we cannot get back. And, and we'll talk about this in another webinar. We need, you know, we need to get to the to the heart and open that blood vessel blood vessel within 90 to 120 minutes in order to stop any permanent heart muscle damage. So I would encourage all those just to remember and tell your loved ones if you're having chest pain at your home, uh, just call 911 if it's severe and you're worried about it. So this is another great question about coenzyme Q10 and fish oil tablets. We're going to cover this in another webinar, but I'll answer briefly now. Fish oil has been very well proven uh, to lower cholesterol and keep people out of the hospital from heart attacks. Coenzyme Q has not, <clears throat> but fish oil, there's plenty of studies about that, and we'll talk more about that in a future webinar. Any questions before we close up? I sure appreciate you logging on. and. <clears throat> Appreciate you logging on, and maybe we'll cover that next question we've given at another time. Uh, or I could um, I can maybe chat with you in a minute. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate you logging on.